I've been showing people bugs since I was five years old. And by the way, this isn't just about bugs. This is going to end up being about people, too. But uh, I showed people bugs since I was five years old, whether they wanted to see them or not. And as a matter of fact, I was just talking with my dad and a couple of friends during break, and he said that they thought I would grow out of it. But it turns out I didn't grow out of it. And when I went to college, I went to college and studied bugs, and then I learned more about them, and I found that eventually people started offering me money to show them bugs. But it turns out they ended up offering me money to show their kids bugs. <laughs> but whenever I had an opportunity to, I ended up spending a lot more time with adults. And whenever I had a chance to talk to grown-ups about bugs, you know, they have a longer attention span. You end up talking about a lot more interesting things. And one of the topics that I want to say kept coming up, but I kept bringing up, was the idea of respect. And when I had a group of adults together, I would sort of force them to say in words their definition of respect. And while we're all being mindful and calm and thinking, think about what you would say if somebody asked you to define respect. Oh, I'm, wait a minute. Let me, I'm asking you to define respect. What would you say? I don't want to put any words in your mind. These are some of the things that come up when you think about respect. One of the things I noticed is when I was talking to adults and they, I was forcing them to, by the third or fourth person, they were really fishing for words, but when they were trying to define respect, it always came up in terms of other people. It always came up with uh, treat others the way you want to be treated. And because I'm a little bit of a smart ass, I would always say, what about cows? The, the, the concept of the golden rule idea of respect sort of falls short when it comes to eating others. You don't really <laughs> think that's the way you want to be treated. Uh, it's not just eating other animals, though. This is the new exhibit at the Columbus Zoo, which if you haven't seen the polar bear exhibit at the Columbus Zoo, you got to go see it. But I'm not sure the polar bear thinks that's its best side. Well, anyway, you find that respect is a very difficult term to define. Even though we all have this general understanding of what it means, when you actually try to put it into words, it's a huge concept that's hard to define. I've started to come to look at it linguistically. And if you think about the word respect linguistically, spect comes, it's the same root that we use for spectacles or spectator, and it comes from the root for to look or to see, and re technically is from the Latin root for back, but as a prefix, we use it as again, and respect means look again. And if you take all of your definitions of respect and put it under the umbrella of looking again and paying more attention, it probably fits. And I'm here to tell you that the more time you take to look again at the world around you, not just bugs, but the whole world around you, people, people, this works with people too, you will never cease to be amazed at the things that you see. I only have enough time to tell you a couple of stories about bugs, so here's the two that made the cut. Maybe. All right. This is a wasp that I uh, was a research assistant studying uh, with Dr. J. Rosenheim, and this was, we studied this Amophila wasp in California. It's a real pretty little, small little wasp that's bright red and metallic blue, and it can't sting you. It's not one of those kind of wasps. If you hold it like this, it'll try to sting you, but it's not strong enough to. But what this wasp does is it builds a single-celled nest in the ground and goes and finds a caterpillar and brings it back and lays its eggs on it, and it's a parasite. And, you know, the whole idea is to look again. But with these wasps, you could look a lot. You'd walk up and down this road and you'd never even see one. But the way that you would find them is to listen again because you can hear these girls digging. Hopefully you can hear the volume on this. If not, I have to do it. Yeah, and what she's doing is she's got these big, huge mandibles or jaws, and she's vibrating her flight muscles but not flapping her wings, and she's like a little drill. And so she'll stick her jaws in the ground, and she'll loosen some dirt and then pick it up and carry it and throw it in the bushes and then come back over and get some more and pick it up and carry it and throw it off in the bushes. And she'll dig this single-celled nest and then find a rock and put it in the entrance of it and then go find a caterpillar, bring it back, pull the rock out, clean the nest out a couple times, then go in, turn around, come out head first, and pull the caterpillar down into the nest, situate it, lay her eggs on it, put a different rock deeper into the entrance of the nest, and then pack a bunch of dirt in it, and she drills it back down, too. You can hear her going, Zzz. 
is, and I couldn't listen to, back then we had Walkmans. I never, I don't even have an iPod, but we had Walkmans back then, and I couldn't listen to it because I had to walk up and down this dirt road where there was an incredible amount of activity of bees and wasps and all kinds of things just making this little city on the side of this road. You'd never even see it unless you take the moment in time to stop and look again. So eventually she covers up the nest and uh, pushes some rocks over the entrance of it and makes it look like nothing ever happened. Her eggs hatch out, eat the caterpillar, and these little wasps climb up out of the ground. But for Amophila, and this is her with the caterpillar, and it's usually a bright green caterpillar. It's an incredible visual. Uh, and she flies, she stings it, doesn't kill it, paralyzes it. If she kills it, bacteria and fungus will start to decompose it, and she wants her babies to be able to eat it. And so she carries it back, and she flies real slowly, carrying this huge caterpillar back. But when she's originally digging her nest, there's this other wasp called Argochrysis, and it is a beautiful little wasp that's uh, bright metallic red and green, and this one you would never see unless you were looking at a mophila nest. It's not, it's like that big. It's, it's compared to her, it's tiny. And when she would have her head down in the ground, Argochrysis would fly from one rock to a, to a branch, to a leaf, and, and it would triangulate the location of her nest and then when she put that temporary closure in to go off and hunt, it would go find another nest. And then it would find another nest. And then every 15 minutes or so, if you sat and watched Amophila's nest, Argo Christus would come back to see if she's back yet. And it takes her about 15 minutes with the caterpillar. So, when, so Argo Christus had it mapped out. And it could monitor four or five different nests. And it would keep checking them all. And when she got back, it got all excited. And when she reached up and pulled the caterpillar in to lay eggs on it, Argo Christus would fly in behind her and lay its eggs on the top of the cell of the nest. Its eggs would hatch first fall down onto the caterpillar, eat Amophila's babies, eat the caterpillar, and you'd get Argochrysis. It's a super parasite. <laughs> it's an amazing world we live in. You guys have no idea. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that. The whole time the nest was open and the caterpillar was there, there was this big fly called Hillarella, a big, huge, hairy fly. And she has what's called false vivipary. She has, she doesn't have live birth, which is vivipary like we, like, our, our females have. She uh, incubates her eggs internally, and she would hover about six inches, maybe a foot above the nest, and flick her abdomen. And she was literally flicking maggots down into the nest, which didn't have to hatch. They had a head start on everything. They would eat Argochrysis, they would eat Amophila, they would eat the caterpillar, you'd end up with Hillarella. There was this whole little crazy, brutal world going on, and you could walk right down the road and never see it. And this was in California, although the video I took was in Arizona, and I found the one in Arizona like five years later because I heard her buzzing because I was walking quietly along the road. You'd never, even, you'd, never, you'd never even see it. You'd never see it. People ask me often what, okay, that's the first story. This is the second one. People ask me what my favorite bug is, and I have a very hard time answering that. Somebody asked me last night at the reception, although I think it's this little jumping spider. And what you just saw was a spider in a cage with a little jumping spider on the outside walking around the outside of the cage. These things are awesome. Jumping spiders are so cool. They're visual predators, and they're real agile, and they're real interactive, and they're one of the few bugs you can see think. Mantids, you can see, think, and these guys, you can see, think, and they're always dragging along a little drag line. And so, if they ever have to make a quick jump, they can, they, you know, they'll hang from a string. You can even yo-yo them if you. I, I tried to get one. If you, if if you had one, you could yo-yo it and climb back up, and you can, and they won't bite or anything. They're really adorable little bugs. And when you watch. Listen, they're really adorable little bugs, okay? And when you watch these guys for a little while, they're so interactive and they've got excellent vision. Right now, this one is trying to figure out what acrylic is. They didn't quite, so those little sensory palps in the front are, are tapping the glass that it can't really see and it doesn't understand what's going on. But they've got really good eyesight. Their two real big eyes have a retinal plane that's got four layers for different wavelengths and polarity of light. And then they've got these two eyes in the back of their head that are real sensitive to motion and they can see things behind them too and that's not supposed to play again but here you can see it's not the that spider in the front foreground is boring the ones in the background are interesting 
I was videoing this one and uh, it had a fly in its mouth and I wanted to get a real good profile to give you an idea of how big the fly was and how it could carry it around and everything. But every time I went to, to get to the side of it, it would turn around and look up at me and it wouldn't let me get this profile view. And one time when I was shooting it, I got to time this talk out, right? One time when I was shooting it, it went to look over at me and the fly's wing was in front of its eyes and it couldn't see me, but they're very, very visual. And so, come on, spider. So when it turns around, it pulls the wing out of its face. I mean, they're just so animated and so, okay, come on, it's an adorable spider. If I had one and I was yo-yoing it right now, you would want one too. Now listen, it's not just watching these guys. You stop and look again at any jumping spider, you will be duly amazed, I promise you. But it's not just watching these guys and sometimes, Listen, we are dull beasts. We don't see much of what goes on around us. Our sensory perception of the world around us is extremely limited compared to those we share the planet with. There's a professor named Damian Elias in Berkeley who made a video of one of these jumping spiders. Come on. One of the, oh yeah, sorry, that's real loud. He's, I can feel it vibrate here. He's on a, on a sound table, and this is a male jumping spider courting with the females, and some of them have really elaborate courtship rituals. On the left of the picture, she is tethered by some uh, low temperature melt uh, wax, and she's conscious but not responding. Don't laugh. He's trying real hard, but this is getting a little too personal, but watch. This is only the sound that, that his equipment was tuned to pick up. You don't know what's going on here. This guy could be playing violin to this girl and she's not responding, but he could be doing all kinds of stuff and you don't even know. But watch what he does. Guy's working it. This little, you'd never hear this, by the way. This is very special technology that's making this happen. I know what I'm doing tonight. I don't know about you. Listen, here's the thing. Um, it, it, by the way, if you want a real treat, uh, Google peacock jumping spider because there's another one that does this dance and he inflates his abdomen and he's got, it's amazing to, to watch. Well, you see stuff like this from these little guys and uh, it leads people to be really amazed. Th this thing is so little. How can it be so sophisticated? And I think, how could it not be so sophisticated? How could it live in the same world we live, have much more dramatic challenges than we have, and not be sophisticated? Their ability to behave is limited by our abilities to resolve their behaviors. We don't see most of what goes on. I'm here to tell you that the more moments in time you take to look again, the more amazed you'll be by the world we live in. But I suggest you shouldn't be surprised. You should come to get used to amazing things in your world. And when you do, you're going to want to show it to people too. That's how the world works. Thanks a lot.